Welcome to Psychology Wizard and Badly 1966B, the classic cognitive study for Edexcel Psychology Unit 1. Here's Alan Badley, as he was in his younger days in the 1960s. It's 1966B because Badley published two psychology studies in that year. Uh, we don't need to know anything about the first study that he published. And even 1966B, in fact, reports three experiments. If you have, for example, Christine Brain's textbook, you'll see that she reports the results of all three of those experiments, but you don't need to know that. The only uh, version that the exam board is testing you on is the third experiment in 1966B. So that's what this video is going to be looking at, badly 1966B, the third experiment. So, before we can look at the experiments, there's an important concept that students need to master for this study, and that's the idea of semantic encoding. Here we've got a picture, two very familiar animals. There's the zebra, and a little bit further back, we've got the giraffe. Now, even very small children are quite capable of telling the difference between these two animals, even if they've never been to a zoo and actually met one. This is the idea of things belonging to different categories, things having very clear differences in meaning. Giraffe and zebra, different species of animals, highly recognisable, highly different animals. It's not the only way the mind stores information, however. Here we've got a bat and a cat. Now, that's also different semantic categories. Bats and cats are very different animals, but this time you'll notice they do sound the same. And that's acoustic encoding. Your mind is also quite capable of storing information based not on what it means, but on how it sounds. So bat and cat are acoustically similar, they sound like each other, but they're semantically different. They mean and refer to different things. Now, Badly is going to test this out by giving participants words to learn from different lists. If you look at list one, you'll notice that, yes, all of those words sound similar. They have what Badly refers to as acoustic similarity. He has a control group who get list two, a bunch of words that don't sound remotely alike. When you look at list three, you'll notice something else is going on there. Those words have semantic similarity. They mean the same. They're all words that refer to size. And of course there's going to be another control group who get a list of words that have got no semantic similarity, that don't have a common theme running through them. So Badley's aim then is to explore how long-term memory works. Now back in 1966, short-term memory had been quite well explored and everybody felt that short-term memory clearly worked acoustically. When you try and hold something in your short-term memory, you often repeat it to yourself, like a little voice in your head. How things sound is very important for short-term memory. Is that true for long-term memory? Is long-term memory just a certain very enduring type of short-term memory? Or is long-term memory something different? Does it actually work differently? This is what Badley thought. He's exploring the idea that long-term memory actually encodes things semantically, not acoustically. How's he going to do this? Well, Badley's going to use those two word lists on the previous slide, and what he's hoping to find out is whether the participants get confused by some of the lists. Because if the participants get confused by a list, it suggests that the similarity relates strongly to how memory works. If your mind stores long-term memories based on their sound, then the acoustically similar list should be confusing. But if it stores memories based on their meaning, then it's the semantically similar list that should be confusing. So, here's the IV, the independent variables. There's a few. We've got independent variable number one, the acoustic condition. The participants who get an acoustically similar word list, and those who get an acoustically dissimilar one. IV2 is the semantic condition, a semantically similar word list versus a semantically dissimilar one. However, Badley is also going to explore something else. He's going to test the participants several times 
recording their scores each time to see if they get better. When you test people over and over again that way, this is called repeated measures design. So here's a rather unusual study because Badley has got independent groups design, the acoustic group being compared to the semantic group and different people in each group, but he's also got repeated measures as well. The DV is the number of words that participants correctly recall, but watch out. Badley's not interested in whether you recall the word correctly or not. What he cares about is whether you recall the words in the correct order. Badley is going to show his participants the list of words, and what he wants them to do is remember it exactly as he showed it to them, in that order. If you get the word in the wrong order, then that's wrong. Badley actually put posters up around the room where the experiment took place with the words on, so the participants had the words in view the whole time. There was never any danger that they would forget a word. What he wants to know is, do they forget the order of the words? The sample consisted of 72 participants who had all volunteered to be part of the university subject panel. That sounds like quite a lot, but remember, this is an independent group's design, mostly, so Badley has to split that between his four groups, the acoustically similar group and the control group there, the semantically similar group and the control group there, and he ends up with only 15 or 16 in each group. So, the procedure. Badly shows each group a slideshow with the ten words on, and each word appears on the screen for three seconds. In fact, in an earlier version, in one of the first experiments, Badly had used a tape recording of the words, but he found that some people had bad hearing, and that became a, an extraneous variable that interfered with things. So here, in the final experiment, he has a slideshow. The participants get to see their acoustically similar words, and a control group will see their acoustically dissimilar words, a third group gets to see semantically similar words, and a fourth group is another control group that gets to see the semantically dissimilar words. After they have seen the words, Badley carries out an interference test. He gives them lists of numbers to listen to and then write down. The interference test doesn't really matter what it was. The important thing is that they have to do something that involves some concentration. This is to stop them repeating those words over and over in their heads using short-term memory. It is a control to wipe out, flush out, remove the effect of short-term memory from the experiment. Badly only wants participants to be using their long-term memory. Again, in earlier versions of the study, Badly didn't do this, and his results were not as he wanted them to be. So this is a control that he brought in to limit, perhaps entirely remove, short-term memory from the equation. Okay, he does this four times. The participants see the slide, they do the interference test, then they are asked to recall the words in order. And as you'd expect, they get better each time they do it. After they've done it four times, Badly gives them a 15-minute break and they perform another interference task and everybody thinks it's time to go home. They put their coats on, they're ready to leave. But no, Badly asks them to do a fifth and final test, this time without the slideshow to remind them. This is unexpected. The participants didn't realise this was going to happen. And this final test is what Badly calls the forgetting test. In a way, it gives the most important score. So, here we've got the results for condition one, the acoustic condition. You've got the control group in pink. And one of the first things you notice, of course, is how much better the control group did at the start, recalling 40% of the words in order. In fact, it takes the acoustically similar group quite a while to catch up with the control group. But by the fourth trial, they have caught up, and by the forgetting test, they've actually done slightly better. So, looking at this, it doesn't seem as though similarity in acoustic coding fools long-term memory too much at all, although there's a bit of confusion at the start. Okay, here we've got the semantic condition. You'll notice right away that the two groups start about the same, but look at that. The control group just takes off. They get better and better by the fourth trial. They've peaked. The poor old semantically similar group really struggle. They never catch up with the control group. 
by the third trial they've peaked and they never improve on that performance they achieve inferior scores. That does look as though something about a uh, semantic similarity is proving tricky for long-term memory. Long-term memory is finding it slippery, hard to keep these words in order in the mind. So Badly draws the conclusions that long-term memory encodes semantically, at least primarily. Um, long-term memory uses quite a few strategies to encode, but clearly semantic encoding is very important. And when the words are semantically similar, this confuses long-term memory, hence the lower scores. It's interesting to go back, however, to the acoustically similar group. There they are. And remember those lower scores at the beginning? Why did they do so badly and then suddenly catch up? Well, it's quite possible that despite the interference task, the acoustically similar group were using their short-term memory to try and hold on to some of those words. But because they were acoustically similar, their short-term memory was getting confused, and it wasn't really helping much. By the time you get on to trials three and four, and certainly by the time you get on to the forgetting task, short-term memory's gone. They're just using long-term memory now, and long-term memory has no problem with acoustically similar words, hence the superior scores. Right, I hope you found that a helpful overview of Badly 1966B, and watch out for another video in which I'll go through the evaluation issues associated with this study.